Buenas and half a day, everyone. Uh, good evening, and thank you for joining us with Independent Guahan General Assembly for March 2022. Uh, Biba Mesh tomorrow. I know today is the last day, so there's been there have been a lot of activities going on in the past month, and I hope that we can continue to do this for the rest of the year. So tonight, what we're going to be talking about is land sovereignty. We have two very esteemed panelists with us tonight. So first will be our Maget Tautau, uh, Senor Robert Celestial, who also happens to be the president of PARS, otherwise known as the Pacific Association for Radiation Survivors. And then along with him will be Dr. Anne Hattori, who is an esteemed Chamorro scholar who focuses a lot of her research on land, health, and just the general history of the island. So thank you all for joining us. Um, today it's gonna be online, so please be sure to include any questions that you have, and we'll do that at the latter half after everyone, after our panelists have gone. So we'd like to open up our general assemblies with the Inifresi, so if you could just follow along with me. Inifresi, gineni mastakilu gihina soku, imastakelum gi korasonhu, zani masfigu, nani nasinyahu, hu ufrasin maisazu, parabaihu protehi, dan hu defendi, i hinengi, i kultura, i linguahi, i airi, i hanum, zanitanu tomoro. Ni idin shoku diretu gininazuas tata, esi hua fitma gihulu i biblia, zani bandirahu, i benderan guahan. I'd now like to um, talk a little bit about what is independent guahan. Uh, so many of you have continued to follow us. We've been doing the General Assembly for more than five years now. But for those of you who may not uh, know what Independent Guahan is, we are a organization that seeks to empower the Chamorro people to reclaim our sovereignty as a nation inspired by the strength of our ancestors and with love for future generations. We educate and unify all who call our island home to build a sustainable and prosperous independent future. I'd now like to introduce one of my um, co-hosts for this evening, Dr. Tiara Napati, and then later on you'll also meet our other co-host, uh, Senora Victoria Lola Leon Guerrero. Buenas and half a day. Thank you for that introduction and thank you all for being here online with us today in the last bit of Miss Tomorrow. Um, we've done the inafresi and the welcoming remarks, but I want to just also share our agenda for today. As Dr. Fran Napati mentioned, we're talking about land sovereignty and we really are excited to have this conversation with our panelists and that we have this opportunity to talk about these important issues of our time. So, um, excuse me, this is a Mistake on the on the flyer here, but uh, we will talk about our Magatata. The last month was signed in um, David De Leon Flores, uh, but of course we have um, Uncle Mr. Robert uh, Celestial tonight, which we'll hear about more later. Tonight we're talking about land sovereignty, and after our panelists go, we will have an opportunity to engage with questions and answers in our discussion. Um, and we're um, hoping that you will also be able to calendar in advance if you can think that far ahead to next month. We are returning um, as of now to have our, our general assemblies on the last Thursday of every month. So looking forward to that um, and, and stay tuned. I have a couple of announcements and then we'll get right into our discussion because there's so much that we can say, of course, about both of these um, important issues. So the first announcement, if you haven't seen it, um, Independent Guahan has our Kulu Zine. It's out now. Um, we've got some reminders here that if you wanna grab a free copy, you can get them here on island at Asiga, at the Numalo Refillery, um, at Antigua Brewing, or at Fauna Cultures. It's got a lot of different um, contributions and art, um, as well as poetry and some other entries that really get us thinking about these issues um, about decolonization and about self-determination for Guahan. So please check, check those out when you have a chance. Um, and if you have questions about um, the zine or other things like that, please let us know. Okay. Um, and I also just wanted to mention there's so many uh, calls for submissions these days and, and actually the Fanogi Coalition is doing a call out asking for people to give, um, whether they're poets, writers, musicians, filmmakers, or visual artists, to just submit creative works. We're really in the um, interest of, of gathering and sharing and reflecting on that theme of what does land back mean um, for um, 
for tomorrow dreams and for tomorrow uh, context. And so you can email your submissions to the Fanogi coalition at gmail.com. Their email is on this slide. It does say that the deadline for submissions is today. So we recognize that some of you watch our uh, programs after the fact, or for maybe some of you who are online, please don't leave to go write a submission. Um, please stay with us, but also do contribute and think about contributing. And I'm, I'm sure there might be some possibilities for, for your creative work to help us think about these issues of land and so timely. So. Um, um, please consider uh, submitting something for the Fanogi Coalition's efforts there. Um, and speaking of uh, the Fanogi, uh, the Fanogi Tsumoro exhibit just opened this week, um, and we know that many of you are, are probably excited about checking it out. It will be at the Guam Museum, and there's events going on as we speak at the museum today, um, but we hope that you'll find some time to, to go and, and to really continue this ideas and conversations that we're having tonight um, with your family, with your friends, um, with other folks, uh, because that exhibit is pretty exciting and it's going on right now and it should be up. Um, I don't want to misspeak, but um, I know that it's, it's going to be up for quite some time. So you don't have to just go um, right now, but please make sure that you think about it and, and consider joining in on that. And last but not least, in terms of announcements, there's just so many um, things to celebrate and things to be excited about. And one of those is our Fanatsu podcast. So Independent Guahan has long run um, this podcast. And just this week, we had some of our own uh, members reflecting on that episode. You might have missed it yesterday, but you can still check it out. Um, the first sort of episode of uh, reuniting and reflecting on the fact that it went from episode number one way back in um, November 2016 to all the way to episode 200. So um, that's something to, to consider and we just want to sort of uplift the different things that people are doing to get us again thinking about these issues um, and thinking about what it means to to be an independent um, island and that what the future would look like so please check out the Fanatsu and um, stay tuned for more exciting updates about that. Okay, I think that's all the announcements. Um, so what I'll do is I'll stop my screen share and I have the privilege of introducing our, our, our first panelist. And so what I'll do is I'll, um, I'll jump right in with that since we have, we have so many um, fortunate opportunities here with the people that are joining us this evening um, and you, you yourself are included. So I will go ahead and um, first introduce um, our, pan, our first panelist tonight, who is Dr. Anne Perez Hattori. Um, and Dr. Anne um, Hattori is from Familian uh, Titang and is a professor at the University of Guam who teaches in the history program, as well as the Tomorrow uh, Studies and Micronesian Studies programs. And her research interests around US colonialism in Guam in the early 20th century, um, in particular, the impacts on health and culture. And she has authored the book, Colonial Dis-Ease, US Navy Health Policies and the Chamorros of Guam. Dr. Hattori is also the co-editor of the forthcoming Cambridge History of the Pacific Ocean. Um, this is a two volume 64 chapter publication that is scheduled to roll out of Cambridge University Press in November, 2022. Uh, and of course, Dr. Um, Hattori loves teaching, but she also indicates that she loves tennis, snorkeling, hiking, and eating. So tonight we'll learn a bit more about our topic, land and sovereignty, from Dr. Hattori, who obviously cares so deeply about Guahan, not only its historical past, but how that historical past can really uh, inform our future. And so half a day and welcome to Dr. Hattori. We so appreciate you being here. Um, and please feel welcome to talk story with us. Um, I know we're we're excited to have you and to have your expertise um, to share with us this evening on this topic. Well, thank you so much uh, to all the organizers. And I'm very honored actually to share time with uh, Robert Celestial, who is a man I greatly admire. Um, the, uh, my bio, you know, I said I love to eat and I think that's you know pretty, very classic Chamorro, you know, talk about what makes the Chamorros, one of them is food and eating. And, um, and it's important, right? Because it's sustenance, but it also has a very direct connection to issues of sovereignty and health. So um, today I uh, titled my talk, The Magic of Sovereignty on Guam, Health of the Body. Um, and obviously it's a short talk. So it's really like, I mean, we could talk forever about these topics. So this is just a really broad general overview, uh, but hopefully enough to give people a sort of a sense of you know, what I'm trying to argue. And ultimately, like um, Tiara has just said, you know, I teach history of Guam and I tell my students that history is really about the past. History really is about the future. It's about how do we learn from what's happened here? How do we take the good, uh, take the bad, learn from that, 
and move on, move ahead. This is what our people have been doing for thousands of years. They've never been stuck in the past. They've always been looking ahead. And um, I hope that, you know, today I can try to do a tiny bit of that. So let me go ahead and get started. Uh, the overall theme of the, okay, well, independent Guahan group, but the general assemblies is always sovereignty, right? And, um, you know, of course, you've got the dictionary definitions of sovereignty, uh, Webster's Dictionary, and, you know, and we think of sovereignty often in terms of political, con uh, political concepts. Nationhood, freedom from external control, right? Supreme power. Um, but I mean, that's just one part of sovereignty, right? Sovereignty also means, you know, cultural sovereignty, right? Freedom to exercise our culture in our way. Um, it extends to economic sovereignty, you know, how to have how to have sustainable economies. And it also extends to our health and our bodies. Um, and so I essentially sort of want to make that connection that our um, control over our bodies and our health is also part of our, our sovereignty as a people. You know, we should kind of think about that a bit more. Despite the fact that we love to eat, you know, we've got to also keep balance all of these uh, interests. For us on Guam, I mean, I don't think it takes a PhD for people to know we have a lot of health problems. <laughs> and the COVID pandemic has really for one, made this word comorbidity, this is like a household term now, you know? I mean, before COVID, I mean, comorbidity, I don't, you know, who used that word in a sentence? Now it's like a daily word. And um, and it's almost like fatalistic, like tomorrow, yeah, comorbidity, you know? Uh, and there, you know, between diabetes, obesity, you know, gout, I mean, some everybody's got something, right? It's there's sort of this fatalistic attitude that if you're tomorrow, your health must be bad. And we've all got these comorbidities. Um, and it wasn't always, and I'm not saying we all do, but of course it's definitely a serious problem. And this is one of the reasons why COVID has been so severe. Uh, but it hasn't always been that way. And I just wanna show some uh, statistics just to put it into a broader historical context. Uh, this, this information I've taken from the uh, book edited by Dr. Robert Haddock, um, History of Health on Guam. If we look at something like, for example, diabetes, heart attack, and stroke, between 1940, 1910 and 1940, that 30 year period, only 3% of Guam's deaths were due to these. By 2000, we're looking at 33%, a huge increase. Uh, similarly with cancer, right? 1910 to 1940, less than 1% of the deaths were due to cancer. In the year 2000, 18% of our deaths the second leading cause of death on Guam. Clearly, uh, our health has not improved uh, with our colonialism. Right? The development has not, so-called development of Guam has not uh, you know, been a positive development for everybody. It's been a lot of health uh, issues. And I tie this to land. I mean, land means so much to us. Of course, land is, and people use the cliche, right? Land is wealth. Um, and for the Chamorros, it has always been, and not in terms of dollars, not in terms of cash, but in terms of everyday sustainability. If we can imagine before the war, people in Guam did not go to grocery stores to buy their food. So imagine what that means. Three meals a day, seven days a week. You have to rely on your ranches, the lungsu. You're fishing, right? You're hunting. Um, and, and how do you have access to that? Well, it's access to your land and your waters. So it was the form of wealth for your family because that was the way in which you supported your family. That was the way in which you kept your family healthy um, and access to your land was just essential. Um, and so, you know, part of our, um, the importance of land is that it has provided us with a, really our material livelihood. But more than that, of course, land is also an important part of our identity as Chamorros. Many people identify themselves as where they're from, right? Tata Sumai, Tata Hodanya. Um, it's where your family is from. It's, it's your bloodline, right? And so land has been a very essential part of who we are as a people. Um, but land is also a very important part of our health because our ability to feed our families and to sustain our ways of life are connected and have historically been connected to our land. Now, I do want to clarify that in the Pacific Islands, 
uh, people's definitions, I mean, I'm using the word land, but people's definitions of their territoriality wasn't just their land, it was also their waters. Your land and your fishing grounds were part of your family's resources. Uh, and uh, Chamorros obviously for you know, thousands of years relied upon the ocean for their protein, sources of protein. And so, you know, between the, the sea, the waters for protein and then the land for their uh, other foods, fruits and vegetables, uh, it was the backbone of their healthcare system. But uh, somehow this has changed, right? And um, I, I focus on World War II really as the, our turning point on Guam. And um, the statistics I showed from uh, Dr. Haddock's book, you know, the 1910 to 1940, so World War II starts in 41. So those are like the pre-war statistics. So then we've got the post-war. Well, before the war, this is the time I'm talking about where Chamorros were reliant upon their farms, their ranches, the Lunsu. Their lives really revolved around their families, right? Very family-oriented, village-oriented, church-oriented. Uh, all major events in your social life were tied to the church from baptisms, uh, funerals, weddings, fiestas. The church was the center of social life, but of course, all within a family context. And then also the ranch, because that's where your food is, you know, seven days a week, right? So you need to have that um, strong relationship with your land and your, um, your ranch. Uh, the war changes this huh, in, in a number of ways. For one, there's just massive destruction. I mean, 80% of all homes and structures destroyed, homes, churches, schools, all buildings, 80% destruction. In some villages, as in PD Hoggett, not a single home was left standing. In Hagatnya, there were like a dozen houses left, near total destruction. About half the population of Guam lived in Hagatnya. Um, the second largest village was Sumai, which is of course now big navy for naval station. And Sumai was destroyed and then of course condemned to become naval station. And 10%, about 10% of the island's population lived there. So imagine at the end of World War II, you've got 60% of Guam that essentially becomes homeless. 60%, how do the Chamorro people survive this? I just have so much admiration because to just imagine today if 60% of Guam became homeless, it was just staggering. It's just, I think it would be anarchy. So just the people, but you know, the people, right? They, they, they're survivors. Chamorro survived thousands of years of uh, all kinds of havoc. Um, you know, I, and I think that it wasn't just the physical destruction of their villages and their homes, because you can always rebuild, but there were other things happening. For one, there was rampant malnutrition. When the US military returned and their doctors surveyed the island, they said there's universal malnutrition here. And numerous reasons for that. I mean, for one, many people, especially men had been pulled away to perform labor, forced labor for the Japanese. Um, not just on the Japanese farms, but Japanese work projects. But if the people are being pulled away to work there, then who's working with the ranches, right? The Lansu. So you, the food supply, the normal food chain is interrupted. And then also the Japanese are confiscating food from Chamorros. Right? Pretty much every family has stories of food being taken from their, sometimes from their very own dinner tables as they're getting ready to eat. Japanese come and take the food away. So you have the situation at the end of the war where there's massive destruction of land, massive destruction of ranches, people are malnourished. Um, and, you know, just universal malnutrition. What do you do? Well, what the, what the military does is basically, they just start to give us food. Um, and, you know, this happened uh, in many places around the world where there was massive destruction. And the military themselves, you know, of course, their own rations are these canned foods. Uh, but for the Chamorros, they basically fed the Chamorros and gave free cases and cases of spam and other canned foods. And there are uh, Chamorros who survived the war who actually have an emotional attachment to spam. They see spam as symbolic of their salvation, of the ending of malnutrition, the ending of all those fears. Um, so, you know, the health, the health issues regarding processed foods is one thing, but you know, when it becomes kind of attached emotionally to freedom, right, then that just kind of exacerbates the whole problem. 
I think that if you had gone back to the Chamorros at the end of World War II and asked them, what do you guys want? I'm pretty sure they would have said, can we just go back to the way life was? Can I just have my ranch back? Can I just go fishing? Can I just, you know, go back to those, those days? But it just wasn't going to happen. And partly it's because of the world war in general. I mean, Guam's experience the, uh, ends on July 21, right? That's our so-called liberation day, the reoccupation of Guam. But that is not the end of World War II. World War II doesn't end until another year, August. 1945, right, when the United States drops two weapons of mass destruction itself on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and then the surrenders uh, a week later. So for an entire year after Guam's liberation, the United States is still fighting war. And the Mariana Islands were very much uh, an important military base at that stage of the war. In fact, as many of you probably know, the airplane that dropped the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki took off from Tinian. So the Mariana Islands were important. Um, they called them a forward base um, as the military went from the mainland to Hawaii, then to Guam or the Marianas, and then from there they'd get um, deployed, right? You're going to Iwo Jima, you're going to Korea, you're going to Hiroshima. Anyway, so you've got this one year where the war is actually still being fought. And during that year, the island was massively militarized. There were 200,000 military on the island that year, 200,000. This is at the same time, at this point in time, there are 20,000 Chamorros. So 20,000 of us and 200,000 military. Uh, there were bases all over the island, got airstrips all over the place. Well, you know, what are they gonna do? How are they, how are they gonna house these 200,000 people? Well, well, they need our land. So they start condemning lands for the military um, for all of these bases. And some of the lands were even condemned for recreational use, military golf courses, military uh, private beaches, military yacht clubs. Um, at its peak, the military condemned 82% of the land, which included 75% of Chamorro farmlands and adjacent fishing grounds. So, what do the people do, right? They, they really, really, they just wanna go home. They just wanna go back to their ranches, the Lungsu. But the lands are being condemned. And at the same time, um, their families are, you know, facing malnutrition. They need to find ways to feed their family. It was just bottom line survival. But they're, because of the confiscation of lands, there's a massive switch in economic practice. and. Uh, just to show you these statistics, in the censuses of 1920, 1930, 1940, uh, you see that the majority of the working population was working in agriculture. So their ranch was their primary um, activity, primary economic activity. 61 percent, 64, 61 percent through the through the 1940s. The 1950 census is down to only six percent, six percent in agriculture due to these military land takings. Some people also, you know, their lands had just been heavily bombarded during the war and you know, the island was massively bombed. Just can't go back to planting right away. So in any event, there's a massive decrease in farming and ranching. So they can't ranch, what are they gonna do? They need to go into the cash economy. They need to get jobs. And at the time, the military is super uh, building up the island. This was the real first military buildup. All of these bases are being constructed. The military needed to hire so many people that eventually they actually had to turn to Hawaii and then the Philippines because there just weren't enough employees on Guam. So the Chamorros were basically forced into the cash economy. But remember, we're talking about the years before the Civil Rights Amendment, before Martin Luther King Jr., et cetera. You still had discriminatory pay uh, uh, scales. You were not paid according to your talent, your resume, you know, your experience, your skills. You were paid according to your skin color. And Chamorros were paid 25% of the salary that whites were being paid. The, the jobs were under the Navy. So their salary, they were getting paid 28 cents an hour. That was the pay for these jobs with the Navy. Um, and just to put it into a context, at the time, a pair of shoes averaged about $7.10. So 
you know, very poor pay. And additionally, Chamorros were not given any sick leave or overtime pay. So there's really discriminatory practices. So, um, you know, what do you do? I mean, for many Chamorros, you know, they had to take these jobs. It's the only way they're going to feed their families. Um, but uh, one of the other aspects of this really is a massive cultural change because this is, this is poverty. These are poverty wages, you know, 28 cents an hour. It's not just discrimination, right? It's, it's economic and racial discrimination. And Chamorros realized that the only way to escape this like, intense, immense poverty is to get a better paying job. But how do you get a better paying job? Well, the educational system under the Navy, you only have to go to school from ages eight to 12 ages eight to 12. That's not a lot of school. So most Chamorros at the time weren't really very proficient in English. They could get by, but you know, the writing, reading was limited. So if you, but if you wanted to get a higher paying job, really, you, it really required English fluency. And so there was a real push for Chamorros, post-war Chamorros, pushing their children really to become proficient in English. And this was a survival skill. So it wasn't about betraying their culture. This was about escaping poverty because their land had been taken and you know, the military paid about a dollar an acre for land. So the, the compensation there was also unjust. So the, you know, the taking of the land, the um, basically forcing the people, forcing people into the cash economy, um, it's just created a series of cultural tensions, cultural problems that we're still dealing with today, right? Um, but also health problems uh, because the, the food chain was dis disrupted, right? People, many people lost access to their fishing grounds because I mean, when the military took land and water, they took the best stuff. So um, uh, many people lost access to those. And at the same time, you know, that was now it's appetite for all this processed canned food, such as spam. Um, and now people had to go to grocery stores to buy their food because it wasn't the ranch anymore. Um, that old system of people uh, growing food and then either circulating it through the Tsutsuli network, right? To family and friends, or in, in some cases simply trade, uh, that was all disrupted. And now people had to go to grocery stores and they needed cash to do that. Um, so there was a dramatic shift from farm grown food, food from the Lanzu to uh, processed foods. By 2010, now the greatest statistics from Department of Agriculture is that 90% of our food is imported. Um, you know, an island that before the war um, was very much self-sustaining. Um, so, you know, I just want to end again with the same message that land, you know, in terms of sovereignty, Land is very important for a number of reasons. I mean, not just uh, in terms of dollar signs, but that it is the material livelihood of the people and it provides us with our identity, but also that land is connected to our health and the kind of food choices we make. And unfortunately, because of the land takings after the war, we've had to deal and face a different kind of scenario. You know, for many of us, we don't have our land anymore. Um, but I would still encourage people, you know, to do what you can, do what we can in, in our time. Every generation of Chamorros for thousands of years has had to deal with whatever situation they were facing at that moment in history. At our moment in history, we're dealing with a situation in which the health of our people are suffering. And, um, and we need to, as part of our sovereignty, kind of recognize that. And, and embrace it and say, well, what can we do? Uh, and there are, now it's, it's uh, actually, um, I think it's a great time. I'm seeing a lot of people, young and old, who are now becoming more aware of these different initiatives, the farm to table type, the Guahan sustainable culture, Chamorro Village, um, but, you know, Dr. Marilyn Salas there, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, selling her farm products. Um, Senor uh, Wistig is, Sometimes you see it by the uh, in front of the guard, you know, selling his corn. I mean, what I'm encouraging people is really to take the time and seek out local uh, produce. It's not only far healthier for you, but it also supports people who are 
working the land. And um, it may not be as convenient as just going to one store and getting everything, but in the long run, you it's just part of this kind of reclaiming who we are and who we can be for the future. I'm just gonna end it uh, at that point. Well, Setsuus Masi, Dr. Hattori, that was so helpful to go through that historical overview, but of course the way that you mentioned it to um, connect that history to help us understand the future, right? Our past guiding us. And um, that's just such an important part of those, you know, just that last even bit about what land means for us and how that connects to sovereignty, how it's so tied up in that. Um, so helpful for us to be thinking about that work. So um, I'm going to turn it, I'm going to turn it over because we have, we have the other, um, things that we can kind of riff off of and, and, and really generate some more discussion. And I'll turn it over to Victoria Lola um, Leon Guerrero now, and then, and then we'll of course be able to continue this conversation with what you started and for folks who are maybe um, putting some questions in the chat or some ideas are coming to mind from what you said. I'm sure there's a lot people are thinking about besides just the historical context of spam, but also the historical context of our sovereignty, right? So thanks so much again. Thank you, Maasi, Dr. Hattori, and Dr. Napati. Um, half a day. Thank you again for tuning in. Um, you know, in, when we don't have sovereignty over our land, essentially, we also lose sovereignty over our bodies, especially as Tao Tao Tanu. And there, had, you know, every month we honor someone in our history that we consider a mega Tao Tao or hero for being a tireless advocate for our people and for justice. And so this month, the mega Tell that we want to honor has done so much work to remind us of what happens when we don't have sovereignty over our land and how it impacts our health. Um, I'd like to welcome Mr. Robert Celestio, who's a retired, um, who's retired from the U.S. Army and is the president of PARS, um, the Pacific Association for Radiation Survivors, which is a 20-year nonprofit organization that advocates for the inclusion of Guam as downwinders, which he will explain, uh, under the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act. Mr. Celestial has dedicated so much of his life to be a voice for so many who have lost their lives to cancers and other radiation exposure related illnesses um, because of what we are exposed to here in our islands. Um, he has, you know, advocated with local leaders. Um, he's been in the media. He's tirelessly worked with other groups across the United States, meeting with congressional representatives and senators, pushing for Guam's inclusion in RICA. He's had doors slammed in his face. He's been, um, you know, rejected on so many levels, but never given up this fight. And for me, that has always been an inspiration that some people, when they have experienced some of what he's experienced, the pushback he's experienced, um, they give up, but he's never given up. And, and because of that, um, he carries on, you know, the legacy of those who did not survive the illnesses because of radiation exposure. And so I'm really honored to know Mr. Celestial and to be able to welcome him today and hear from him about his work. Hafa day and welcome. Hafa day, Gwyneth. Thank you very much, Victoria and everyone. My name is Robert Celestial, and this is our first group. We started in 2001. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. And, uh, and then we just continue on uh, as we lose members, we gain members and uh, we continue to have uh, uh, general memberships once a year, but through COVID uh, we had to uh, do Zoom. But we have one this year, so that's pretty good. Next please. And that, this one was over at uh, the governor's house up in the Ganyan Heights and that was a wonderful time. Uh, next please. Next slide. Yes, and Victoria said, uh, you know, we've got help from a lot of people in the past, and this is a tribute for those sacrifice and dedication. You know, uh, Speaker Mpinko, Senator Angel Santos, uh, late Speaker Ben Pangolina, Dr. Paris, a good friend of mine, and we hired Dr. William Brady, and Mark Pidey came from UK, all the way to Guam to help us. And of course, Lieutenant Bert Schreiber, who was here in 1952, who really, really helped us in the National Academies of Science through his uh, sworn testimony and the late Ed Benefit, the uh, Chamorro activist, 
the story goes through all those years. Next, please. Yes, from 1946 to 1962, the United States detonated 66 uh, hydrogen bombs in the Marshall Islands with 43 detonation at Inuita Atoll. Uh, this is a photo of the first hydrogen bomb detonated in the Pacific at Inuit Atoll on November 1st, 1952. A lot of emphasis is always put in the Bravo, which is done two years after this in 1954. I was stationed in Inuit Atoll in 1977 to help clean up all the post debris. And I was also affected uh, by uh, just being there and working with ionizing radiation. Next, next slide, please. I just wanted to show you the 40 islands at Inuit Atoll, and uh, the Northern Island is highly contaminated, and it detonated 43 nuclear bombs there. And uh, it's and all the radiation came to Guam during those time periods. Next, please. And I just wanted to show you the where the Republic of Palau, Federated States of Micronesia, Republic of Marshall Islands, Commonwealth of Nor Northern Marianas, Yap, Chuk, Pompeii, Kostra, and Guam. And we are directly in line uh, from actually in the Wittak and Bikini Island. And mm -hmm. just let you know, uh, next slide. This is a radius uh, of the blast from Bikini Island. So uh, majority of all the islands got uh, inundated with nuclear fallout. Next, please. So this is uh, Lieutenant Bert Schreiber. He was the chemical, biological, radiological officer here in 1952. And so I found him in Texas. I asked him if he could give us a sworn testimony, but he was under his top secret clearance and he said he couldn't. So we went to the Department of Defense, Department of Navy and gave him a green light because it's been de declassified back in 1994. And so after I came back from Washington DC in 2004, uh, presenting our case to the National Academy of Science, I stopped by his house to thank him, and uh, there he is, Lieutenant Bert Schreiber, who was stationed in Guam in 1952 when his Geiger counters were going up the scale. Yeah, thank you. Next, just wanted to show you a diagram of the uh, actually the wind and and um, uh, let's go there. goes from, from west to east. Okay, next slide. I, wanted, I hope it works. The other one is, it, it usually uh, has a, a little movement, but I just wanted to show you uh, the precipitation that it comes from uh, the west to, uh, from the east to west. Next, please. And what is the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, which is RECA? It was enacted in 1990 for compassionate payments through President Bush at a time that uh, uh, other states were asking to be uh, compensated because what happened is that he went to the courts and the Supreme Court gave a writ of satori saying you're in the wrong venue, you need to go to Congress. So they enacted the RECA program. Next, please. So President Bush signed the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act in 1990 and he says that I'm today signing into law the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act. And down in the bottom, you see that the bill provides compassionate payments to persons with specified diseases who fear that their health was harmed because of fallout from atmospheric atomic testing in Nevada test site, regardless of whether causation can be scientifically established. Next, please. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, next, next slide. Thank you. So four years later, um, in 1994, the Secretary O'Leary from the Department of Energy asked President Clinton if they would declassify all the agencies in the United States, and they did. And so, uh, next slide. So President Clinton at that time formed the Human Radiation Experiments Advisory Committee and asked uh, Dr. Ruth Payton from Johns Hopkins University chair the advisory committee at that time. And so next slide. It's very important to understand because the Human Radiation Exper Experiments Advisory Committee uh, went out to all the warehouses, all through the different agencies and, and uh, <clears throat> declassified all the documents and found atrocities that they did on different uh, experiments to the American people. And so next slide.
Next slide. If you like, I'd like to read. Between April 1994 and 1995, the advisory committee held 16 public meetings, most in Washington, D.C. in addition. Subsets of committee members presided over public forums in cities throughout the country. The committee heard from more than 200 witnesses and interviewed dozen professionals who were familiar with experiments involving radiation. A special effort called the Ethics of Oral History Project was undertaken to learn from the eminent physicians about how research with human subjects was conducted in 1940s and 1950s. We were granted unprecedented access to government documents. The president directed all the federal agencies involved to make available to the committee any documents that, yeah, that might further our inquiry wherever they might be located and whether or not they were still secret. That was very, very important because later on they would uh, compile all this information on the website uh, called the HREX back then uh, from 94 to 2004. And I'll tell you what happened to it uh, later on. Next, please. Yes. So then uh, the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act was enacted in 1990, like I said, requiring the federal government to compensate individuals who develop diseases due to unintended exposure to radiation from atomic testing. And that's what we're trying to get today is that we have two bills in Congress, uh, HR 5338 and Senate Bill 2798 uh, that hopefully they'll pass this year. Uh, so Guam and New Mexico, Idaho, Utah, um, Colorado, Montana, and the Navajo Nation that we would be compensated with this program. Okay, next please. So RECA-5 categories, there's on-site participants, downwinders, uranium ore transporters, uranium millers, uranium miners. We already qualify for on-site participants for the washdown they did in uh, Apple Harbor and in um, Cocos Island Lagoon. So we were asking in our bill is that Guam be afforded to be compensated through RECA as downwinders. Next, please. So in 2000, uh, they amended the, rate, the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, and, and mainly what it did, it modified medical documentation requirements and removed certain lifestyle like smoking restriction. It also added additional geographical areas to downwind claim. And that's what very important because they did add uh, other geographical areas in 2000. We missed it in 2000 because I didn't come out of the, now my research to 2001. I wasn't ready at that time. I was still doing research, uh, trying to find out other information. And so we missed it in 2000 and um, hopefully we'll get it this year. Next slide, please. So forgotten, but not left behind. How did Guam get into the RECA picture? Huh. Next, please. So in 2001, a four page report from myself, I submitted to the governor, to the delegate's office, to the archbishop, to the speaker of the office and all the senators. I informed them that Guam and her resident were exposed to radiation. Next, please. And uh, Angel Santos, uh, Senator Angel Santos and Senator Mark Forbes formed the 26th Guam Legislature Blue Ribbon Panel, which I was a part of, Dr. Park Paris was a part of. And what happened is that I took all the 20 boxes that I had of declassified documents, they compiled it, they hired two people, uh, Chris, uh, Mr. Briscoe and Mr. Will Castro, and they came up with a 97-page report of radiation fallout Guam. You could go on, on Google and download it and read it. It's quite extensive. Uh, next, please. So the Board of Radiation Effects Research Committee. Very important because two years later after the amendment, uh, in September 2000, Congress mandated HRSA to help Human Re uh, Resource Services Administration in accordance with the public law 107-206 to task the National Research Council Board and Radiation Effects Research Committee to conduct a study. They were to go out throughout the nation and do another study. And, uh, and one of their, their mandates was to find out what other geographical areas to include back into the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act. And so I found them, I called Dr. Isaf Nabusi and uh, I asked her, I said, can you come to Guam? She said, no, they don't have the finances. Can I come? To, to the last meeting, which was in March of 2004, and present our case. Next slide. And so I was invited, uh, Dr. Pierce, Dr. Youngberg, and, and myself, 
we submitted uh, letters with Dr. Guzman uh, to Dr. Uh, Isab Nabusi, and she came back with an email inviting all of us to come present our case. But I was the only one uh, to to present our case because Dr. Uh, all the doctors were um, had a large schedule at that time, so I had to go myself. But what I did was I hired uh, William Brady, health physicist, who retired from the National Academy of Science. I sent him all our documents, and he said if we paid his all his expenses, he'll come and represent Guam. Next slide, please. So this is a uh, uh, former congresswoman and Senator uh, uh, Fernandez, and this is Mr. William Brady. He received the highest uh, scientific award from the National Academies of Science. He came out of retirement to represent Guam because the information he gave him was, was uh, he said that Guam should be included in RICA. So we brought him. Uh, next slide, please. So this is Dr. Julian Preston uh, on your left and Dr. Isaf Nabusi after the, uh, the board hearing there in uh, the National Academies of Science. Uh, people from Idaho, Colorado, all, all the different states presented before we did. And so I gave them oral and written testimony about, uh, it, you know, actually in my statement, I said, uh, you are the experts, uh, you determine whether Guam should be in Rica or not. So we, that, that was my uh, oral testimony. Okay, next please. <coughs> So the documentation evidence was submitted to the board uh, of the Radiation uh, Effects Research Committee. The scientific studies and reports on ionizing and radiation found in Guam during Pacific nuclear testing. Even the sworn testimony of Lieutenant Bert Schreiber uh, retired that the Gallagher counters were of the scale here in Guam, in November 1952. And uh, <coughs> his sworn testimony, uh, testimony was, was uh, uh, had a big effect for the scientists uh, at that time, Dr. Dupel, to make the determination on our conclusion. So next, please. So I just wanted to show you this because the Department of Defense and Department of Energy back then in 2001 to 2004 uh, wrote back and said, no, we never washed down any uh, ships here on Guam, uh, not knowing that I <laughs> extrapolated the information from the HIREX uh, website at that time and uh, found out that, yes, they did wash down uh, Go to uh, target ships that were in the Marshall Island, brought into Guam, washed it down. So uh, I submitted this to the National Academies of Science at that time. Next, please. <clears throat> so this is the front page of the report to Congress from uh, the Burr Committee. It's called the Assessment of the Scientific Information for the Radiation Exposure Screening and Educational Program. Next, please. So Operation Ivy is very important for Guam because. In November 1st, when he detonated, three days later, it was Lieutenant Bert Schreiber's Geiger counters were going off the scale here on Guam. And he couldn't tell the people. Matter of fact, he felt so bad that he said, I wonder what's going to happen to the local people years later. Next, please. So this here is a diagram of the dose rate of Guam prior and, and in uh, November 3rd, 1952. As you saw, Mike Ivey was detonated three days prior. And so there was a high peak here in Guam, the same time that uh, Lieutenant Bert Schreiber's Geiger counters were going up the scale. So they just matched the two and he said, yep, he's telling the truth. <laughs> so the evidence was, was amazing. So next, please. So here you see uh, Strontium 90, which is a radionuclide, <coughs> and uh, Salt Lake City, if you see in the center, received the highest amount of Strontium 90, and Guam came in second. Pretty amazing. So this was the conclusion. Uh, it says page 183, but it's on page one, uh, 200. So the committee initiated an independent assessment of the radio radiological consequences related to the weapons testing specific to the people living on Guam. Um, most of the details are assessment are presented in Appendix C. Appendix C doesn't really say anything. The most important thing for Guam is this conclusion. There's two conclusions. One is for downwinders and one is for on-site participants. But the conclusion for downwinders <clears throat> is why we're fighting so hard. And it reads, as a result of its analysis, the committee concludes that Guam did receive measurable fallout from atmospheric testing of nuclear weapons in the Pacific. Residents of Guam during that period should be eligible for compensation under RICA in a way similar to that of persons considered to be downwinders. Now, remember in the beginning that 
there's ore transporters on separatism and downwind. So we were recommended that we should be included in RECA as downwind. The second conclusion was for the washdown and they didn't have any uh, information on that one. So next, please. Uh, next, uh, these are old bills. We have two, uh, these are old original bills, but we have two more bills, which is HR 5338 and Senate Bill 2798. Next, please. And I just wanted to show you the half-lives uh, for radioactive, like uh, 4.5 billion years for uranium uh, 5,700 years for carbon. But the one that's very important is cesium, strontium, and INN at that time only lasts for eight days. But the 30 years and the 28 years is that they only gave us eligibility here in Guam from 46 to 62. But the half-life of cesium and strontium is 28 years and 30 years. So when we negotiated the years for Guam, I asked them, can you bring it all the way to 1992? Because the half-life 30 years from 62 should be 1992. Because what 46 to 62 was only giving us detonation dates, not exposure dates. And I wanted to make that clear. So we only got uh, detonation dates. Next, please. Oh, I, well. Uh, I wanted to stop here, but uh, we could go to Inuit, uh, what's that, the cleanup when I was there in 77, 78. Next, please. We'll go through it real quick. It's me on the left. That's Sergeant, the late Sergeant Bloss, Mr. Susuiko. This is where we are in Lodro, where he detonated the 43 nuclear bombs. And we were there. Uh, they contaminated soil from one island, put it on the Rennet Dome. Next, please. So that's how we go to work. That's our mail call. These are the debris we threw into that dome. Next. And this is the dome of prior to the dome because they detonated a nuclear bomb. They didn't tell us that when we had to go in there. Next, please. And this is the aftermath of the detonation. We had to drain, try and drain that out before we built the dome. Next, please. And this is half completed. Next, please. And the completion of the dome. Next. <laughs> and that concludes uh, our presentation. And thank you so much. And I hope and pray that uh, they pass our bill this year or they extend it for two years because we would definitely need uh, health care and the, the, the benefits that other states have been receiving for many, many years. And uh, the people of Guam deserve it. Thank you. God bless. Asiduas Ma'asi, Sinot Celestial, and to Dr. Anhitori. Our We've gotten a lot of comments on Facebook, and now we're going to move into the question and answer portion of the General Assembly. And okay, so I... Before, sorry, before that, oh. we wanted to talk about how to get involved. Dispense it to Dr. Fran. Um, so before we get into our question and answer um, portion, um, I'm hoping that those who are watching are as interested as I am in helping uh, Mr. Celestial and Pars in really trying to advocate for Guam's inclusion in the uh, Radiation Exposure Compensation Act Amendments of 2021, also known as RICA 2021. So time is running out, as he expressed, um, and these amendments need to be passed before July. 2022. So what can you do? Um, the most important thing you can do at this point is to really push your representatives. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, oh, sorry. Um, so those who are living in the continental US with uh, voting members of Congress and uh, senators, um, we highly, highly encourage you to reach out to your congressional representatives and senators. Um, and here is a sample letter um, that you can use. Um, and basically, if you also need um, a copy of this letter or a template of this letter, you can email us at independentguahan at gmail.com and we can send it to you. We can also try to make this available on our Facebook page where you're watching this um, General Assembly. But basically how you would want to structure your letter is to, you know, do a formal greeting to the representative or senator you're writing to, introduce yourself and explain, you know, that you're a resident of their district um, and that you're advocating for 
uh, RECA 2021, and then you give the context, which would be that um, from 1946 to 1962, residents of Guam were exposed to radiation fallout. And then you go into, as a result of that exposure, the evidence from the Board of Radiation Effects Research Committee's uh, conclusion that Guam was in fact exposed and received measurable fallout uh, as downwinders, and then ask that they support um, this bill or co-sponsor this bill. Um, and then you can write a few sentences about yourself or your loved ones, if you know loved ones who had any cancers or radiation related uh, illnesses. Um, and then, you know, you can explain, you know, if you have had any cancer or radiation exposure related illnesses, um, or even if you haven't, that you know of countless fa families in Guam that have, and therefore you are urging them to do this um, so that um, these people and their families can see justice. Um, and then send that to your congressional representative right away. You can make phone calls, you can, you know, use all the channels to reach out to them. If you're here locally, next slide, please. Um, Speaker Therese Terlahi is collecting um, testimony. So Guam re re residents impacted by radiation exposure related cancers and illnesses may contact her office. Um, the phone number is 472-3586, or you may email Senator Terlahi Guam at gmail.com. And if I could kindly ask um, Mr. Celestial just to say, a little bit more about um, how people can, can get involved and the urgency of them getting involved today. And also, if you could also express for those that will want to know what are the kinds of cancers um, and illnesses that make people eligible for uh, compensation. And also, you know, any other guidance on what they can do now, how they can help PARS, um, that kind of thing. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to read from the list of diseases that are compensable to RECA. Uh, in the past, uh, in today's law, leukemia, but not chronic lymphocytic leukemia, is not included now. However, it is in the amendment uh, to be included. So if it's passed, uh, leukemia, uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia would be included. Primary cancer of the urinary bladder, multiple melanoma, primary cancer of the colon, cancer of the pharynx, cancer of the thyroid. Uh, lymphomas other than Hodgkin's disease, cancer of the pancreas, cancer of the small intestine, uh, cancer of the male or female breast, cancer of the salivary gland, primary cancer of the bile ducts, cancer of the brain, cancer of the liver, uh, except if there is evidence of cirrhosis or hepatitis B, uh, cancer of the stomach, cancer of the gallbladder, primary cancer of the lung, cancer of the ovary, <clears throat> and also it includes uh, in the CFR uh, uh, chronic other chronic diseases that can be established by um, medical physicians. And, and it's very important. I'm glad that you brought that up. Hold on, plane's going over my house. Okay, very good. So uh, the letter and, and the support we need from the from the mainland, from, from people from Guam, uh, whether you're Chamorro or non chamorro but you have family that's uh, had cancer, or you just want to help, it's very important because we've been reaching other organizations in the States to try and, and, and go and talk to their, their uh, representatives, the senators, the congressmen and women to, to take that letter and, and ask them for their support. Advocate, because this is for a lot of families here in Guam. Uh, because if uh, not only if they have passed away, but if the spouse is still alive, the spouse could apply at least not for the medical care, but for the benefit of the $150,000. Or if the parents have passed, then the children can apply. If that and then it goes all the way down to the grandchildren. So, so this is this is the the RICA program in itself. So I think this is the since we only have less than three months, this is the only way that we know in the frontline community and the RICA working group in the states that we have Zoom meetings every Thursday, Tuesday and Thursdays. That we've been advocating uh, meetings with with so many senators, congressmen, and women but we need the constituents because we're from Guam. Uh, a lot of times they won't listen to us because we're not their constituent. But if you're a constituent from Texas or California or Washington State or Idaho or somewhere, that you, you are their constituent. You could go there and, and knock on their doors and say, hey, look, here's a bill. Would you support and co-sign this bill? That's very important. That's, that's the main uh, uh, 
advocacy that we could do right now since we only have uh, less than three months. Thanks, thanks, Victoria. This Maasi and yes, thank you, Lola, for um, cutting me off at that moment. Um, that is information everybody needs to know, especially since we've been very fortunate with Independent Guahan to get um, an audience from just all over. So we have people who tune in from the Marianas. We have um, tons of people who tune in from all over the United States and from abroad. And we have people who will later on watch this video. So please, um, please talk to your delegates, talk to your representatives and to your senators, wherever you are, and please let them know that Guam needs to be included on this list. Um, and so since we're speaking a bit more about how we can get politically active around RICA, um, one of the, a lot of the questions that were coming in were, um, someone was asking, why has it been so difficult for local and national leaders to support Guam's inclusion in RICA? And what are, what have their, arguments been against it? And since the bill is currently with Congress, how can Guahan's delegate work with PARS since the bill's currently on the floor? Okay, um, first of all, it's, we're trying to get a bipartisan uh, vote uh, support. This is very difficult. Uh, right now we have a majority of Republicans and uh, I, mean, I mean Democrats, and we've been successful. We, we passed the House bill, to the Judiciary Committee. And, and, and that was a hurdle we've never been, uh, we've never gone through for the past 20 years. Uh, and, and the difficulties, there, there's so many difficulties. One is that we don't have a delegate that can vote. That's one, okay? Uh, two is that uh, Guam is so far removed and, and the good thing that, that has happened over the years is that we were able to convince the frontline community group, which is Utah, New Mexico, and Idaho, to keep Guam in the bill. We, we had, uh, I mean, we had so many meetings, so many uh, uh, to, to help one another over these past years. And, and it was only through uh, New Mexico, uh, Tita Cordova, to keep us in the New Mexico bill, the House bill through Congresswoman Fernandez. To get us in, in, in the Senate bill, they adopted Guam. Idaho adopted Guam. I hate to say it, but they did. And, and they adopted Guam through Tony Henderson. Tony Henderson and I became good friends years ago. And, and when, I, when I flew out to Boise, Idaho, on a downwinders conference back in, uh, way back in 2006, I believe, and, and I gave a presentation there. So we built a relationship ever since 2006. And that's how Guam is, is kept in the bill. The difficulty how Congress is not passing and why it takes so long is because it's quick, it, it was a Republican majority at one time, then it switched over to Democrat and, and, and went back and forth. And so uh, they have all the answers. Uh, I really don't have all the answers. Uh, I'm just, uh, I'm just uh, trying to keep Guam in the bill. Uh, there, there's so many, so many things that, uh, that we were blessed uh, especially when we're writing this bill for this year, uh, the Legislative Council asked us what gave us a wish list. And so our wish list uh, was uh, back then the other bill, uh, 2018 bill, they had a three year break, 59, I mean, 58, 59, and 60, where they weren't going to compensate anyone where there's three years. And also, you had to be on Guam for two years, which was very difficult. And so when I, when I asked them, I said, could you run it concurrent? And you, could you give us the same one year as, as New Mexico? They said, okay. So that was a good, uh, um, what you call it, negotiation, if you might say. And so we were able to do that. Uh, why Congress moved so slow, so many things that happened. COVID, now Ukraine, uh, back then it was Donald Trump. <laughs> so, so many issues. And so um, I can't speak for the congressman at this time. He has to come out and speak to the people of Guam on this issue. That's okay. Again, Sita Asmaasi for sharing that. Um, it also really, I think, leads really nicely into our next question, um, which is that, um, you know, one of the things that prompted us 
to focus on land sovereignty in particular is that um, recently the congressman had uh, shared that he was looking into wanting to revive efforts for a Guam constitution. And the response that he received was that, of course, if Guam were to embark on a constitution, one of the requirements would be that it would continue to affirm US sovereignty over the island. You know, this was what President Carter had responded the last time the constitution was submitted. Um, it, at every juncture, it has been made clear, not just for Guam, but also for other territories who have embarked on a constitution. Um, the Virgin Islands had the same struggle that in order for Congress to approve of any constitution from an existing territory, it would have to continue to allow for U.S. sovereignty over that territory. And so in the case of Guahan, um, you know, hearing your stories about, you know, not having voting representation, um, that is the equivalent of not having full sovereignty, right? And then therefore not being able to advocate for our health, not being able to change, um, you know, any threats to our island and our health and our well-being. And so, you know, I wanted to kind of hear from our panelists about, you know, um, what does that mean for the U.S. to continue to uh, maintain sovereignty over the island? What does it mean for our lands, our health, and our quest for decolonization? You want me to answer that, Victoria? Uh, yes, or, or both my, you my... and Dr. Hattori. Oh, okay. Oh, well, go ahead, Dr. Hattori. You be first. No, go ahead, Robert. That's a very hard question. Yeah, okay. Uh, first of all, I just want to say that uh, the FSM, Balao, and, uh, and Marshall Islands are negotiating right now with uh, the United States on the compact. Very important issue. And and I was asked by their leaders, their senators, and their, their, their people saying, why is not uh, the FSM uh, being included in RICO? And I said, the difference is that we're U.S. citizens. That's the only reason we are in RICA right now is because we're U.S. citizens. And, and if we were an independent nation, we would have to uh, do the same thing as the FSM and the Marshall Islands and negotiate through a compact uh, uh, like they're doing right now, which I believe, uh, I can't speak for the leaders, but I, I, I think they have the upper hand. Because China's over there trying. Matter of fact, China just got the Solomon Islands. If you guys didn't know that, and uh, and and now Australia, New Zealand is is, is up in arms, <laughs> you know. And, and you read the stories and you say, "Wow, what's going on?" And and it's who's going to take care of who a lot better. Uh, that's the way I see it. That's my opinion. But uh, as as for independence, for here in Guam, we have to ensure that we, even though we have independence, we have a relationship uh, with them. Not not for them to be an authoritarian like, like it is now, uh, because they're not a territorial of the Marshall Islands, or, nor FSM, nor Palau, they're independent nations. And so I don't understand, uh, may, maybe later on in the future, uh, but that's how I see it. Uh, even when I read the book about how Palau became independent, it was through the women. The women is the one who pushed it, you know, all, all the way to, to the legislation. And, and it was amazing, I said, wow. You know, I mean, wow, the women uh, actually, uh, did this, even though they had a backlash like everybody does. But uh, that's that's my take on it, is that uh, at, at this time, uh, the only reason we're in RICA is because we're U.S. citizens. I mean, the trick of colonialism is convincing the people that they are incapable of taking care of themselves. That's the whole premise, right? You are not smart enough, so we'll take care of you. You're not capable. You're still children but keep working on it you know we we can teach you but, but you do this for you know for us for hundreds of years and i mean i think there's a one of our challenges is a real mentality among the people that we can't survive without uncle sam and it's very I, offensive doc <laughs> doctor i i take that yeah. those comments very offensive because we have very yeah. intelligent people i think what it is, yeah, is that yeah. we have a hierarchy of our own people right. who don't yeah. want uh, yeah. Independence, uh, because of of their their wealth. Right. Uh, I, oh, yeah, I, hate, I hate to say it, but that that's the truth. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm no, going to get backlash on that one too. No, but it serves their interests, right? People. Yes. Uh, and so, and, and in part, I mean, I think why would anyone oppose Rika? I mean, Guam's inclusion. It's 
they don't want to offend the military because through the military, they can sell more burgers, they can sell more cars, they can sell more movie tickets, right? But for us as, you know, as a people, um, it really, it's tough because it's a matter of also mentally um, having people realize that, first of all, that we're very competent. All these nations around us are, you know, they are managing their own government. Exactly. Um, you know, uh, Palau is doing it, you know, the FSM is doing it. Hello, are we less capable? Are we less hardworking? Is there any reason why we couldn't also? But it, but people need to kind of sort of wake up. It's just a kind of realization. And then to also uh, Robert's point is that we on Guam have been kind of brainwashed to believe that we need the US, but we don't realize that actually they really need us. And that's why they've sunk their claws in so tightly. It's like they need Guam. And if we can realize that, then that really increases our bargaining position. Because it is. this is what FSM, Palau, and Marshalls know. They know the U.S. needs them. The U.S. needs control of the land, the waters, so their submarines can go through and make it all the way through where the oil supplies are. And they know it. So they, they know that, oh, well, you know. And, and that's why we need, Doc, we, we, need, we need leaders. We need leaders with that mentality who's going to change things. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and, and that's the way it is. If, if I believe our people are afraid. They're afraid. It, it's like uh, that old saying, a bird in hand is better than what do in the bush. And, and that's what it is, is, is that they're afraid uh, to, to let go and, and that we're going to lose everything. And, and no, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you already came up with different analogies how we could do this. And, and, and I think we can. I was thinking this would be a good time to chime in was based on the back and forth that you both have shared and just really appreciate that because they're it's so complicated um, and what you've raised is the power dynamics right and some of of course that that trick of colonialism and the mentality there and and it does it connects the historical to how we understand the future and how it can be guided by that so maybe um i know there's a lot that we could still unpack from that question that um that victoria lola just asked but i was thinking we could use this to also um, address another question about those paths like what are the paths um uh, that exist for regard regarding our sovereignty um or you know do do we argue that um, that we never lost it or gave it up? You know those kinds of um, questions. And and would this be something um, when we're thinking about the paths for sovereignty for Guahan? Is um, would it be something that um, like in the Hawaiian context and how um, there are some divisions in the movements there? Um, so if either of you want to speak to some ideas about paths for sovereignty for Guahan, since you've given those examples from Palau and, and other examples as well, and how those impacts can happen. I'll, I'll let Dr. Tar take the lead. Well, well, one thing I want to say is that <clears throat> is that the past is plural, and um, it's it's not fair to to say, "Oh, you people, make up your mind. What is it you want?" As if the Chamorros are all supposed to all agree on one thing. We would never tell that in the United States. You can't have a president so you all agree who's the winner. Hello, it's not hundred percent gets the vote. It's majority. Right. And. Pacific Islanders are just as capable of having factions and different opinions. I mean, you know, we're human beings, right? So, but that it's used against us, right? To debilitate us. Like, well, you guys don't even know what you want. So until you know what you want, then, you know, don't even bother us, right? It's like, hello. I mean, at, at least let us engage in the discussion. So, you know, ask us what we want, which has never even been done, right? So, so yeah. Well, I don't have an easy answer. There's no easy answer, obviously. If there was, they would already be already figured out, right? There's lots of smart people uh, working on this question. Well, there, there's a lot of things that that can happen. Is that uh, if, if if people want, they could they could have a, a reservation and a tribe here, you know, like like the Indians, but majority, you know, they can't if they if they really wanted to, and then they could have their own sovereignty uh, because uh, some feel that. There's no way that the U.S. is going to uh, give up Guam, but this is my take. If the education, if the people, the next generation, are are well informed on on uh, on the issues, uh, especially 
uh, the Spanish rule, and then from Spanish rule to American rule to Japanese rule back to American rule, if they really understood that who we are, who we are as people, uh, and uh, we're mixed, we're so mixed. We have uh, a Spanish with Chamorro, we have uh, a Japanese, Korean, uh, you know, Chukis, we're, we're all mixed. We, we uh, integrated uh, with, with statesiders, everything. So it's, it's kind of pulling us in different directions. And, and that's what I see uh, the difficulty is that we can't come to a conclusion of, uh, um, of a majority to try and, and push this issue as, as, a, as, a, as a really strong subject. And I'm sure that, that independent Guan has really, really gone, gone far and, and beyond. But as for me, I, I think there, there needs to be an, a, a larger educational program for, for the generations to come. Um, you know, and, and it's hard to change. You, you know, you could have facts, you could have uh, uh, really good opinions, but it, you can't change the mindset. <laughs> the mindset is so hard to change. Uh, in, in, in this, in, on these issues. Uh, and, and what it is, is that I, I think is the benefits, right? I mean, how, how are you gonna weigh the benefits? Uh, it, the majority of this, the, the, and, and that's what it is, that we have to weigh the benefits. And, and we need good leaders uh, in the future to come up with really good plans, how we're gonna do this. Uh, a lot of people wanna keep their US citizen. A lot of people wanna, uh, it, uh, you know, I mean, do we have dual citizenship? Do we do we have an independent? I mean, it's it's, it's real. It's not tricky. It's just a, a large dynamic that somebody has to come up with a solution. Uh, I don't know. I don't have the solution, but but I see I see the issues, but I don't have a solution for that. It's difficult for the people, especially when you know we've got you know really high poverty rates, high. Um, cancer rates, uh, many people are maybe working on a position of uh, just surviving, right? And start dreaming, which is really what this is about. It's dreaming about a better tomorrow. It's hard when you're trying to feed your family today. Amen, I, I like that. You, you know, you just reminded me when I first started this uh, uh, activism back in 2001, you know, and uh, working with Sen the late Senator Angel Santos, he introduced me to Maslow's Law. <laughs> I said, what's that? I, I don't understand. What, what is that, Maslow's Law? The hierarchy, right? That's what you were talking about? The hierarchy. And only the 1% gets to get their, 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 their sound bite out there because the majority uh, are, are worried about their rent. They're, they're worried about where are they going to buy their food? Uh, where, how are they going to pay their bills? And the other issues are, are are very minute to them. It's only like the wealthy. If you if you're gonna, uh, uh, which affect my my wealth, then they come out and and they protest and they say, hey, you can't do this, or they do it in secret. And and so <laughs> that's what it is. It's Maslow's law of hierarchy. Yeah. I, I think that also brings us to another important part of the discussion. So as you guys have been talking about kind of the mindset that happens when we become colonized, uh, one of our um, listeners was asking, what is the evidence of exposure for tomorrows? And they were mainly asking this because they themselves believe everything that's happened and a lot of the stuff that we talk about in our exposure and that we need to be included as part of downwinders but they also know that members of their family won't believe that data or even that argument in the same way they do. And so they kind of wanna know what can we say to people who may feel that we don't qualify as downwinders. And then also they were asking, can we file downwinders claims now or would we have to wait until Guam gets included on that bill and then have other veterans come forward besides um, Lieutenant Schreiber? I'm, I'm trying to find my book. Um, and uh, yes, um, no, you can't file yet because the bill hasn't been uh, uh, being passed in law. And two, to convince others that, that don't believe 
Don't believe us. Believe the National Academies of Science. The National Academy of Science is the highest scientific community in the U.S. Tell them that is that they're the ones who determine that Guam uh, should be included, and 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 show them the documents. I mean, it's just a one page like they just presented uh, here in my PowerPoint presentation. It's the conclusion, and if you showed them that, it said, okay, now now now, what you don't you believe? It, it's a very simple and very impacted uh, conclusion. It just spells out the residents of Guam during that time period should be compensated because why they're affected by nuclear fallout from, from the, the Pacific proving grounds and that we should be included in, in, in the radiation exposure compensation as downwind. It's very simple because in the beginning, in the first 10 years, uh, or, or I don't know, uh, five years, it was only me expressing that Guam was, was inundated with nuclear fallout. But when the National Academies of Science came out, that's when people said, okay, something's definitely uh, uh, here's the answer. Here's the answer to our, our, our questions that we have for many years. Why are people sick? But then even doctors here in Guam that, well, maybe, you know, and then blame our, our health on, on, on the fast foods. And, and I said, uh, the states have the same fast foods. They don't have high rates of certain things here in Guam. Uh, like, like, you know, so, so that's my answer to that question. It's the National Academies of Science that's saying that Guam should be included in that one and that we were exposed. It's very simple. I hope that helps. Yeah, definitely. Uh, sort of building on this idea about health and our connection to the land, um, someone who was watching had really wondered about the diet of Chamorros before colonization, which I know Dr. Ann, you had, you had spoken about in your presentation. And they asked, how do we get back to that? How can we transition from, I want my land back to land back for the people as a whole? Um, and another question that came in that's related is since Guam is so urbanized, can we learn lessons from urban farms around the world? And so um, Dr. Hattori, do you want to respond to that? I'm sure. Um you know, obviously, we can't go back exactly, not yet, at least. The military has taken so much for prime farmlands. Um, but, you know, like tomorrow's have always done, you, you figure out ways around it, right? What can you do? And um, and I'm actually really encouraged with the younger generation. So I've seen a lot more uh, action in this arena, you know, people trying to, even in like little apartments, have their own like a um, cherry tomato plant or you know even having their own herbs just little little steps but you see any little step you take towards growing your own food is a step towards sustainability right and 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 better health for your family better health for the whole island and imagine if this became a kind of island-wide effort right uh, I mean, the potential is, is and it's not just simply at, at that level it's not just simply about you know having local bananas instead of terrible chiquita stuff but it's also like empowering right <clears throat> i mean it just feels good for me when i eat mr wilson's corn oh my gosh i love his corn it just feels good that i ate his corn you know it's just a different kind of feeling when you're eating and when you eat right when you eat fish it's somebody caught you, you know it wasn't me but my cousin or whatever it's just a different feeling and it's a connection to our place and i think that's really special you know i'm like one of my uncles i'm just remembering like um, just through my whole childhood, he was always known as like this school kind of drinker, always getting into fights and everything. And after he retired, he went back to the ranch and started farming. And he was just like a new person. He was just had so much pride. He always had uh, vegetables to share. And it was just like, you know, for, for someone in his 60s to really become a new man. And I think that something, you know, working the land and having, being productive, right? And sharing. Having that sensuli, you know, it, it, I think it's very empowering, and it it so it goes beyond even food because it's about you know your family, you know your sensuli networks, right? So you start sharing with your family, your friends, and, and then they start sharing in return, and it just triggers like this whole different kind of cycle. Um, so you know, the, although the diet before the war, uh, you know, was mainly farm food, and we can't necessarily go back to it we can compensate in other ways. 
and do what we can, and even if it's in small steps. I really love that idea too that you said this, you know, not just small steps of doing what we can and the ways that the um, you know, just, just reflecting on the conversation that you both are having as panelists to share uh, the history and the and the current issues that are going on because, you know, the this raises another piece that we could bring up, which is that historical context, right? So we know, um, you know, from 1944 to 1946 with that massive population boom uh, among military personnel here on the island, you know, one of the questions raised is how did Samoro people feel about being about being displaced to the degree that they were from these lands, right? Um, and then, you know, kind of connecting that idea um, and that issue to how do you feel that there are, um, or do you feel that there are parallels between uh, this, you know, the situation of displacement then and the current military buildup that we're experiencing here on the island now? You know, when the um, first buildup happened, um, you know, Chamorros were just so relieved that the war was over. Many people really thought, you know, I'm, am I even going to make it out alive? And there was genuine like, gratitude to the U.S. for saving the Chamorros. And people really thought, well, you know, let, let's do our part to help end this war. You know, if you, you need to use my land, you know, use it. Defeat the Jap Japanese, right? But you see, before World War II, land wasn't a commodity there weren't real estate agents on Guam. You didn't go into an office and say, I need land, I want, right? Land was part of our heritage. So the concept that land could be lost forever, you didn't do anything about it, it's just gone. That just wasn't part of their reality because it, that's just not how it happened. So after the war, you know, it's just a whole different scenario. You know, the thing that's the one thing of value in there, like the one tangible thing, it's taken from them, right? Um, but um, so initially, they're very happy to be helping, doing what they, they can, but they don't understand that the military is not going to give that land back because that's not how it works. It was just part of kind of our tsutsumi, you know, kind of use the land, then defeat them, and then, okay, then go back to where you came from, and I'm going to go back to my ranch. Uh, but by 1946, 47, okay, so Japan already surrendered, you know, in 45. The U.S. is still not giving land back, and in fact, they're still taking more land as the years go by, even though uh, the war was already over, right? They're taking land now for private beaches, and so, so that because they said the military, the morale of the military is part of national security, so it is essential that we have golf courses for our personnel. So even though that golf course was a family's ranch, the military said, the Navy said, well, it's part of national security. So at that point, Chamorro are really getting upset. And uh, this is this eventually leads to the Guam Congress walkout, which I had written about was in my master's degree. But um, yeah, you know, so definitely, um, yeah, I mean, obviously people are, people are in the post, uh, Dr. Timing, Patricia Timinglow, who's a clinical psychologist, I mean, her research, she wrote about basically that Chamorro's really as a, as a people, really went through and are still experiencing post-traumatic stress, but it has never been addressed. But it's just the concept of just trying to imagine like the, a whole island of people who've just been through a kind of violence and deprivation. And then, and then the U.S. comes back and then even more so, right? It doesn't end. Like, and, and, that, and they're starving and they need to feed their families and their houses have been destroyed. Like, I think that they're just trying to pick up the pieces and pull their lives together and try to keep their families together. And I, I just think they were dealing with so much like on every level, it wasn't just their land, it was also their health. And then it was just every possible angle they were dealing, they were being bombarded. And uh, yeah, they just, you know, it's not a happy time really, but you know, they, they made it through, you know? But it, uh, I would say that especially when the lands were not being returned, that was when the real question. And then they really hoped that the Organic Act might, you know, rectify that, which it did not. And, you know, thankfully over time, the Chamorro Land Trust uh, came about to try to address that. But, uh, wow. As a, as a sort of final question, because both of the things um, our panelists have covered have really talked a lot about 
what's happened to Guahan and to the Marianas as a result of this hyper-militarization that's occurring in our region. And so Dr. Hattori, you've talked a lot about kind of what militarization has done and how it's displaced our people and really has affected not only our health, but just sort of even our mentality and the way that we think of ourselves, right? And then so, you know, at Celestial, you've um, really tried to push for Guahan's inclusion in RICA. And we know that the nuclear testing, it, it all is connected to militarization because this was at the height of the Cold War when there was a lot of fear about um, a lot of superpowers creating nuclear arms and things like that. So now we're in another sort of set of political tensions and we're seeing a lot going on, especially with Ukraine and Russia. And so one of our um, one of the people watching asked, as the tensions grow in our region and with US adversaries, what kind of messages does our community and our leaders need to be sharing and formulating around war, nuclear weapons, and peace? Um, my, my first, um, what I'd like to see for Guam is our senators to pass a law to place uh, monitoring systems for ionizing radiation all over the island and in its waters because we have nuclear submarines. And to be, um, you call that, given the responsibility of EPA, Guam EPA to, to calibrate it and to make sure, and, and when they find something, to make sure to tell the people of Guam. And that's what we don't have. We don't have a monitoring system. Japan in Fukushima just, uh, in, in Google, they, they showed this really, really, uh, sophisticated monitoring system that now they're placing all over in that area. And, I, and when I looked at it, I said, why, why don't we have, why don't, why don't we warn the people of Guam if, if, if you know, there's a spill or, or radiation gonna hit like, like Lieutenant Bert Schreiber when his Geiger counter is going off the scale. That's how you protect the people of Guam today. And that's, I, I brought this up to a couple of senators and and I don't know if they're gonna do it, but this, that's the main thing that, that my concern is, is that we need monitoring systems for our, our people. We know that the submarines are not leaking and, and, and radiation is not falling on us and nobody's telling us again. That's very important. Uh, you know, that, that's my take on that one. I think that since World War II and Guam was occupied, a lot of people had this idea that okay, we were occupied and Japan did everything they did, but if we, the military had been stronger, we would have been safe. So a lot of people kind of equate the military with safety, which is completely wrong. In fact, if the military wasn't here, no one would care about us. North Korea would be a wouldn't target. be threatening us. Yeah, we wouldn't be a target at all. And the, the whole threat to our peace is because of the military. So the military is not, does not make us safe. It's the opposite. And, uh, but, and yet, you know, people, so, so it's a kind of like reframing people's mentalities a little bit, I think. Uh, you know, what and, is and not only that, Dr. Tori, is that uh, me being, in, uh, you know, retired from the Army and, 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 and a lot of, even my kids uh, being in the military, we have a lot of families that are military, oh, yeah, we're, yeah. we're military mindset. Yeah. Uh, it, it's very difficult to separate that. And, and say, hey, you know, the United States did so much for us, you know, and this and that, which is true. However, you, they have to, to weigh, you know, like, like the balance, you know, they have to, you can't forget who you are, where you're from and what our history is and just throw it out the window. You can't do that. I haven't done it. Uh, I, I still have the, the tomorrow uh, uh, culture in me. Uh, matter of fact, my middle name is Napoli, you know, to, to make good. <laughs> A lot of people ask, is that a family name? I said, no, that's my middle name. <laughs> you know, and they said, I've never heard of that. I said, well, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a true Chamorro name. And, and I thank my ancestors for that. And so uh, we just got to continue to change the mindset. It's very difficult. And, and that's where we have to, be, uh, you know, start. But you guys have done a, a great job. Ah, Viva, that's a wonderful note to leave on this evening. I feel like this conversation could go on for a very long time, but I do appreciate all that you have shared and this, um, be the beginnings of becoming Nat Malik, right? How do we make yeah. good for our people? And so, you know, some of the things that I heard tonight that I hope the audience uh, takes away is that, you know, um, 
when we don't have sovereignty over our lands, it impacts our health, our well-being, our happiness, right? Um, you know, that we are still a community living with PTSD and um, cancers and other illnesses that are taking lives um, that really shouldn't be taken in this way. I was thinking as Dr. Hattori was talking about the irony that we want to build a new hospital and the parcel of land we want to build it on was taken by the military and now we have to lease it from them. So all these harms that are done to our body bodies um, because, and we have no monitoring system to tell us the source of it, and yet we still have to pay extra just to be able to build a better health facility for our community. There is no accountability and there is no representation that allows us to hold the U.S. accountable um, to the need to rectify these situations. And so when we think about a path forward, like Dr. Hattori said, sure, we will all have different visions of what that path may be, but how do we learn from from our history to ensure that whatever that path is, we have voice, we have the ability to protect ourselves and future generations from life-threatening illness and war, and that we have a say in all decisions that are made on our behalf. And I believe that at the heart of sovereignty, uh, you know, um, voice is the most important. And I appreciate your voices, Dr. Hattori and Mr. Celestial. You are uh, two of my personal heroes, and I feel so honored to have shared this space with you and um, our independent Guahan um, EDR co-chairs, both doctors Napati, <laughs> um, both Dr. Francine and Tiara Napati for your time this evening. Sizos Maasi to everyone for tuning in and we will see you next month. Adios. Adios.